We're in our second week of this series and talking about um, who we are in Christ, what Christ has accomplished in us, uh, what Christ is doing in us, his work in us. And here's what we have on tap today. Our theology is this. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Our application today is this. The Christian life isn't to work, uh, the aim of the Christian life isn't to work harder, but to submit more. And our prayer today is, God, we ask you again to do your work in us so that our lives will bring you glory and honor. The author of Hebrews is making the case in the book of Hebrews that Christ is better than everything else. In Hebrews chapters 1 and 2, the author is saying that Christ is better than angels. Christ is better than Moses. In chapters 3 and 4, he is inviting the people that today is the day of salvation. Put your trust in Christ. Believe in Christ. In chapters 5, 6, and 7, he says that Christ is better than Melchizedek of the Old Testament. And in chapters 8, 9, and 10, he says that Jesus is better than the Old Testament sacrifices and that Jesus is the better than the Old Testament priesthood and that heaven is better than the Old Testament temple. He is doing all these things to invite the people to put faith in Jesus. Then chapter 11, he tells the people all these things that uh, people trusted God for, all these times that people put faith in God. And then chapter 12, he says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin which so easily entangles, and let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The author, as some of your translations will say, and finisher of our faith. There's this concept here that's presented in the book of Hebrews. Paul represents it a couple of times also in Philippians But there's this concept here that God is the one, Jesus is the one who starts this work in us, this salvation work, this saving work in us, but that Christ is also the one who finishes it. I've been in church my entire life, 47 years I've been in church, and for 47 years what I heard from other people, that's not fair because I've been preaching 27 of those, so for 20 years uh, what I heard from other people was something along this line, put your faith in Jesus so you can go to heaven or put your faith in Jesus so your sins can be forgiven or put your faith in Jesus so you won't go to hell. And then the next part of that was, and here's all the things you need to be better at. Here's all the rules. Here's all the things that you need to do better. Here's how you should dress for church. Here's how you should talk to people. Here's the kind of things you can spend your time doing. Uh, I can't tell you, I don't know anybody else, maybe my age who uh, in youth, remember you went home and you threw away all your tapes because the youth pastor had told you you can only listen to Christian music. So you threw away all your tapes. That got really expensive because then you had to just go buy them again. Uh, and, uh, and and so same thing. In, the same thing happened in college. Like, man, like if you're not listening to just Christian music, if you're not reading just Christian books. And so like there's like all these things, like here's what it looks like to be a really good Christian. And I don't know if you feel this tension or not, but that's kind of exhausting. It's really exhausting when you're constantly trying to figure out what you need to look like. And depending on which pastor you're sitting under at the time or what kind of church you're going to at the time, the rules are different. They change, you know, and they're a little bit different now than they were when we were kids. Or they're, ah, and it's exhausting. It wears you out. And it's because somewhere along the way, we were misinformed. We were taught that Christ starts this work in us, but that we need to finish it. We need to make sure that the, we're still moving forward. And that is just not biblically true. Christ starts this work in us. Christ completes this work in us. It is about what God does. Paul says it this way to the Philippian church in Philippians 1.6. He says, I am confident of this very thing, that God who started this work in you will carry it on to completion to the day of Christ Jesus. That God is the one who starts this work in us, and God is the one who finishes this work in us. If we were to sit down, you and I, and we were to have a talk, uh, I am sure that even if we didn't agree at first, at some point we would come to the place where we all acknowledged, one by one, that I can't save myself. I can't be good enough to save myself. I can't do enough good things to save myself. I can't be holy on my own. I can't be righteous on my own. And we would get to the place where we go, yeah, man, I was in need of a Savior. I needed Jesus, right? And yet somehow we think that once we become a Christian, I got it from here, God. Thanks for bringing me to this this place, but I'll take over from here. I couldn't make myself holy to begin with. What makes me think I can make myself holy now? God's the one who makes me holy. God is the one who, who sanctifies me. That's to be set apart for holy use. God is the one who does this work in me. I referenced it last week, but Philippians 2 verse 12, a lot of people 
quote this verse and then just kind of stop a little bit short of where they should. But Philippians 2.12 says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But there's a hyphen there, right? There's a hyphen or there's a semicolon there. And then the rest of the verse says, because it is God who is at work in you both to will and to act according to his good pleasure. God is working in us. Christian, he did not save you and then say, all right, your turn. He saved you and is still with you. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1.13 that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, that we are no longer people of the flesh, but people of the Spirit, because the Spirit of God dwells in us. I want you to think about that for just a minute. The Bible introduces us to the Holy Spirit in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. We see the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament come on Moses with power, uh, indwell Joseph, not Joseph, well, he comes on Joseph as well, but he indwells Joshua with power. He, he works in the life of Daniel. He, he comes on Samson to do great feats of strength. He lives in the heart of David, and David writes these beautiful psalms, and David serves God like the Holy Spirit is full of power and life, and now that Holy Spirit lives in us. I wonder why so many Christians say stuff about their sin or say stuff about uh, their marriage that isn't quite where they want it to be or their relationship with their kids. And they're like, well, I'm only human. I can't tell you how many people are like, they'll come to me or they'll talk to me or Michelle or they'll say, look, our marriage is in trouble, but, you know, like we're only human, right? No, no, that's not right. You are not only human if you're a Christian. You have the power of the living God alive inside of you. Where did we get to this point that we believe that my only humanness is somehow more powerful than God's only godness, right? God is bigger than us. And he hadn't left us alone to kind of work out this Christian life on our own and to figure it out and just kind of to grope and to stumble and to make our way through darkness and just hopefully get there. He started this work in us and he is the one who is continuing this work in us. It is God who sanctifies us. It is God who makes us holy. The Bible says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul closes his letter this way. He says, Now may the God of all peace himself sanctify you completely. That is set apart for a holy purpose. Now the God of, may the God of all peace set you apart for a holy purpose. And may he do that completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. I want you to think about this for a minute. What if every sermon you left... I don't know your church history. I don't know your Christian history. But what if instead of leaving a church service going, man, that was good. I need to try harder. I need to be better. What if every church service we left, we left going, man, God is faithful. He is faithful. And he who sanctified me and set me apart for a holy purpose, he will complete it in me. What if we left with our confidence in God instead of responsibility on us? I'm not saying that we're free of any responsibility at all. We'll get to that in just a minute. We have to be a little bit out of the way, okay? But God, God is bigger than you and I are. God is more powerful than you and I are. You go, man, but you don't know. You don't know the short temper that I have. You don't know how I treat my kids. Here's what I know. I know that God loves your kids. Anybody have a problem with that? God loves your kids. God loves your spouse. God loves your coworkers. Do you believe that? And here's what I know. Here's what I know to be true. If you and I would get out of the way, the spirit in us looks like God because he is God. And the spirit in us loves your kids and loves your spouse and loves your coworkers. Do you believe that? Man, like, let God do this work in us. It's going to bring us really quickly where we'll spend the rest of our time to this application. The application is this. The aim of the Christian life isn't to work harder but to submit more. The aim of the Christian life isn't to work harder, but to submit more. In every other thing in life, if you want to be good at something, you have to work hard at it. That's not entirely true in most everything. I have one thing that's in my head right now. Like, I, I, I'm just going to tell you, as an artist, if you don't know I'm an artist, that's how I make a living. As an artist, I, I, I am offended by the people who buy a canvas and paint it white and sell it for $20,000. I am, I am offended by that because I'm like, it's, and like, and I mean, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like, okay, more power to you. 
you know, some idiot paid you 10 grand for a white canvas. Like, listen, you can do that. Go buy the canvas, paint it white, save yourself $9,900. You know what I mean? But like, but almost everything else takes practice to get better at. Almost everything else. Almost everything else, if you want to be good at something, it takes work. I was painting live at a fundraiser yesterday, and I had some kids. The kids are always my favorite to have around me when I'm painting because they're, they're amazed by everything. <laughs> and and I, had, I had barely started, and they're like, that is amazing. And I'm just like, thank you, <laughs> you know? I, I need those kind of people, like I've told you, insecure, right, pessimist. Like just, I need those kind of people just following me around all the time. Um, <laughs> but... But, but I, somebody said, how, like, literally, I, I'm not joking. I wish I was exaggerating here. It's funny. I had taken a brush, and I made one stroke, and the kid was like, that is cool. How do you do that so smoothly? And I'm like, <laughs> and I was like, well, it helps that this is my 703rd painting, right? You know, like, it, it helps, right? That helps. If you're an athlete, you work at it, right? You work at it to get better. I was 5'2 and 99 pounds my sophomore year in high school. I was just skinny and weird and long, like my arms were down to here, you know. My feet were already a size 12 my sophomore year in high school, but my body hadn't grown. The swim coach walks up behind me one day and he goes, you're kind of skinny and lanky. He goes, I bet I could make you into a great swimmer. He goes, you want to be on the swim team? And I'm like, I didn't know we had a swim team. And he, I'm kidding you not, I'm in bowling. I'm in PE bowling my sophomore year. <laughs> and he opens a door, and on the other side of our gym is a pool. And I'm like, <laughs> he goes, come try out later today. I said, okay. I said, I'll be there. I said, I don't have a bathing suit with me. He goes, I'll lend you one. Wearing another man's Speedo will change your life. <laughs> it just does. I get there, I dive in, I'm swimming, and he goes, do the breaststroke. I was like, I don't know what that is. He goes, it's kind of the one that looks like a frog. I'm like, okay. We have a pool at our house, so I go underwater, and I swim as far as I can underwater, thinking that's impressing him, right? I hear him whistle. I come up. He goes, you're supposed to stay on top of the water. I was like, look, man, I don't know what to do. And he goes, you're on the swim team. I was like, okay. He goes, show up for practice tomorrow. So I showed up, for, went and got a Speedo that day, didn't want to borrow another one, and was on the swim team the next day. The hardest part for the first month was the flip turn. I nearly drowned every day. <laughs> How do people do this without getting water in their nose? That's what I always wanted to know. But I got better. There were five of us that moved up from JV to varsity after a semester. Now we were swimming from 6.30 to 7.30 in the morning, 4.30 to 6 in the afternoon, in the water two and a half hours a day, swimming multiple miles a day. And it was hard, right? When you were training, when we were getting ready for a swim meet, uh, our coach would make us wear tank tops, and, and socks to train for swim meets. And then the last few days before a swim meet, because you're increasing your drag so that you could feel like you were flying, right, when you, when you went into the water. The last few days before the swim meet, we would wear a weight belt, a bungee cord, and a five-gallon bucket, and we'd sink it into the water, and we'd swim with it. And you'd barely feel like you were moving, right? And flip turns now were way more dangerous because it's not just you in the lane. There's like six other people. And when you flip turn, you had to watch out that you didn't go into yours or somebody else's bucket. Um, that happened a few times. But you'd go really low and you'd come under people's buckets and you're swimming. Now, all of this was to make us better, right? Make sense? We had to work for it. And you kind of got to decide that day, like, if you were going to work or not. How hard are you going to swim? How hard are you going to, what kind of effort are you going to make? But according to your effort, your, your effort determined your improvement. Does that make sense? That's almost everything that is not Christianity. Your effort doesn't determine your improvement. Your surrender does. God does his work in you. If we will get out of the way. If we will let God do what he wants to do in us. If we will get out of the way, he will change us. Let me, let me read you this text. Let me show you something here. This is from Zechariah chapter 3. I promise I'm going to Galatians. Bear with me. Zechariah chapter 3. I had some friends years ago who 
uh, were forming a Christian band. They wanted a new name for their band. I begged them to have the name Dirty Joshua <laughs> from this text right here, because you're going to see it's all about salvation. It's beautiful. But there was a guy in the band named Josh, and he did not want to be Dirty Joshua. <laughs> I gave my second choice for them was Ornan's floor, if you know, and uh, and they went with that one. I think they should have been Dirty Joshua, but <laughs> Zechariah chapter three verse one. Zechariah is having a vision, and it says this: Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand. Let me pause here really quickly. In the Old Testament, you will see sometimes it says an angel of the Lord, and sometimes you will see the angel of the Lord. Angels are created beings, okay? And there's a couple of places in the Bible, twice in the book of Revelation, where John bows down to an angel, and the angel says, don't bow down to me. He goes, I serve God just like you do. But the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, receives worship. The angel of the Lord does and says things that only God can say. So it is commonly understood that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is... Christ incarnate or the Father incarnate or the Spirit incarnate, like they're showing up in some for, sort of form here. So here is the angel of the Lord, Joshua the high priest standing in front of the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this, Joshua, is not this a brand I have plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel and was clothed in filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they clothed them with white garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing nearby. So here's the situation. The angel of the Lord is here. Joshua's there. The Satan is standing at his right hand to accuse him. And before Satan can even accuse Joshua, the angel of the Lord speaks and says, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. This is one that I have plucked from the fire. There's some imagery there. Imagery of being saved from hell, imagery of being saved from judgment, imagery of being saved from wrath. He goes, this is one that I have plucked from the fire. And he says, remove his filthy garments for I have taken away his sin. And we go, yes, thank you, God, for saving me from hell. Thank you, God, for taking away my sins. And then yet somehow in our Christian, all the Christian self-help books, all the Christian writings, that's unfair. It's not all of them. That's a lot of them. In a lot of the Christian teachings, in a lot of the Christian writings, they say, yes, yes, you've been rescued from hell. Yes, yes, God has taken away your sins. Now, what are you going to do about it? What are you doing with that? How are you living? But the next part of this is the angel of the Lord not only says, this is one I've rescued from the fire, not only says, this is one whose sins I've taken away, he says, this is one that I have clothed. And he covers it in festal robes and puts a clean turban on his head. See, listen to me, Christian. Christ didn't come just to save you from hell and to forgive your sins. He came to make you holy. Your holiness isn't your responsibility. It's his. This is what God does in us. This is the work of God in us. Why, why, do, we, why do we think that, that God is somehow powerless to change us? He's big enough to save us, but not powerful enough to make us different, not, more, not powerful enough to, to help us love people or show people kindness or mercy or forgiveness or grace. Look at the work that God has done. Look at what God has accomplished. There's a story in the New Testament of a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years. She has a medical problem. She's been bleeding for 12 years. Instead of getting better, she's gotten sicker. The Bible says she spent all of her money on doctors for 12 years, and instead of getting better, she's gotten sicker. Jesus is walking. There's a big crowd of people around Jesus. He's walking along. The woman says to herself in the Greek, it says that she kept saying to herself, if I just touch the edge of his garment, I'll be healed. If I just touch the edge of his garment, I'll be healed. She comes through the crowd. Now, as a Jew, she's not supposed to be touching other people. She's considered unclean because she has this this blood flow. She's considered dirty. But she comes through the crowd. She touches the hem of his garment. She's immediately made better. She's immediately made better. Twelve years, she's done everything she knows to do. Finally, she goes, all right, I'm coming to Jesus. I'm going to let Jesus deal with this. And Jesus deals with it in a flash, in a moment. In Luke 5, Peter and, uh, and his brother Andrew have been fishing all night. They're fishing all night. Um, 
They wash their nets. They haven't caught anything. Jesus is preaching. He's been pressed up to the edge of the Sea of Galilee. The crowd's pressing in around him. He steps into Peter's boat and says, put your boat out a little ways. So Peter puts his boat out a little ways, and Jesus finishes preaching to the crowds on the shoreline. He then turns to Peter, and he says, drop your net into the water for a catch of fish. Peter, the professional fisherman, Jesus, by the way, at this point, is a carpenter and now a teacher. Just saying. He's also God. Makes a big difference. But he turns to the professional fisherman and he says, drop your nets down into the water for a catch of fish. And Peter says, Lord, we have fished all night and caught nothing, but because you say so, we'll do it. And they catch such a great number of fish, they signal for their partners, James and John, to bring their boat out. Both boats are now filled with so much fish, they begin to sink. Peter had done everything he knew to do, everything that he could do, and Christ was still better than everything Peter could do. Christ was better than everything Peter could do. There's this story that I really love in the book of Judges about this man named Gideon. God comes to Gideon and he says, Gideon, I'm going to use you to rescue the Israelite people from the Midianites. Gideon gets together an army. Gideon's army is 32,000 people. 32,000 people. They are going to war, the Bible says, against 135,000 people. If you're good at math, right? Then they're each having to kill four and a half people. Four and a half people to every person, all right? I don't know how you kill half a person, but that's just how the math works, all right? He's half dead, you know? You leave him for your buddy. Do you still need your half? This guy's almost dead. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> God, God says to Gideon, God says to Gideon, he says, you've got too many people. You've got too many people. I don't want you to be able to take credit for this. You've got too many people. Tell everybody who's scared to go home. I want to know what this must have felt like to Gideon. He gets up in front of everybody and he says, God has said we've got too many people. Everyone who's scared goes home. I imagine that Gideon is feeling like, I bet we lose a few. Out of the 32,000, 22,000 left. Gideon's going, Okay. We each have to kill 13 and a half people now. 10,000 to 135,000, right? God goes, you still got too many. I imagine that Gideon at this point is starting to feel a little bit of the pressure. You still have too many, Gideon. I don't want you to be able to take the credit for it. Take everybody down to the river and ask them to get a drink. They go down to the river, they get a drink. There are a group of people who bend down and drink from the water. There are a group of people who cup the water to their mouth. It's split 9,700 God goes, send this 9,700 home. We'll do this with the 300. Gideon like, is like, okay. We know Gideon's a little bit nervous because God says to him, if you're a little bit nervous, go into the Midianite camp and hear what I'm going to do. Gideon and one of his soldier buddies sneak into the Midianite camp at night. It's still one of the funniest things, I think, in the whole Bible. They sneak into the Midianite camp at night. They're listening at a tent. Get this picture in your head. Two soldiers. They have an army now of 300. They're going against an army of 135,000. These two soldiers, Gideon the leader, is shaking with fear. They come in. They're listening at the, the tent. And the two Midianite guys inside, one Midianite guy goes, man, I had a weird dream last night. All in the Bible. You'll find it in there. This is not, I'm not making this elaborate, right there in the scripture. Midianite guy goes, man, I had a weird dream last night. I had a dream that a large barley loaf rolled into camp and squished our tent. That's his dream. The second dude goes, whew, that's the sword of Gideon. We're all going to die. <laughs> like, that's the interpretation of the dream. And Gideon is like encouraged by this, you know? He goes back. Here's the point. The 300 guys beat the 135,000 guys. Here's how. God says, Gideon, here's what I want you to do. I want you to circle their camp. Everybody has a torch in one hand and a pot so it's concealed, and everybody has a sword in the other hand or a sword on their hip and a trumpet in their other hand. And he goes, when I tell you, I want you to break the pot so that the fire will shine down in the valley, and I want you to blow your trumpet and say a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. They do that. They break their pots, 300 pots. Light shines down into the, into the place. They blow their trumpets. They say a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the 135,000 people panic and get up and kill each other. Kill each other. We're sitting here going, I got it, God. Why? If God 
can bring victory to 300 people over 135,000 people. If God can have an army walk around a city and just shout so the walls fall down, if God can take a woman who has spent all of her effort to, to cause the bleeding to stop and God touching the edge of his robe just heals her, if God can take a professional fisherman and just say, put your nets in and you'll catch some fish. And he goes, we fish all night. But like, why do we think, thanks for the salvation, I'll take over from here. Why? The very first thing, the very first thing, when you come to me and say, man, Ryan, I'm struggling with this sin. Man, Ryan, my marriage is in trouble. Man, Ryan, I can't quite, f- I'm Ryan, by the way, if you don't know. Man, Ryan, <laughs> uh, I, I can't seem to ever treat my kids with grace. I don't seem to have patience. The very first thing that I'm going to talk to you about every single time is, do you know how much you're loved by God? That's what I'm going to tell you every single time. That's where we're going to start. Because somewhere along the way we were taught in church history, we were taught by church culture probably, we were taught, be better. Next time you're feeling angry, go into the other room, count to 10. Now, I'm being serious. Like, that is legitimate advice people offer, right? You ever been offered that advice? You ever heard? Just take a deep breath, go into the other room, and count to 10. And if it doesn't work, you count to 10 again. And we're thinking that this fixes things? How are you and your kids doing? The other day I had to count to 1,768. <laughs> like, we, we think that somehow we're, the, God saves us from hell, we save us from being bad. No. God is the one who started this in us. God is the one who finishes it in us. This is not swim practice. You don't have to almost drown today. Anybody just exhausted from trying to be a better Christian? Anybody just exhausted from trying to meet the standard? Anybody just exhausted from trying to fix everything? God is the one who does this work in us. It's kind of like this. This is a really (coughs) bad example. And I used it in the first sermon and I regretted it. And I'm going to use it with you guys too and regret it. (laughs) We, we, keep, we keep thinking we need to make ourselves better. We need to do better. We need to be more. I, I want you to begin to start thinking of yourself like a tree that needs sunshine. You're a tree that needs sunshine, and it is not the job of the tree to, like, chase the sunshine, right? The sun just is, and the tree gets the sunshine. Does that make sense? God is. God is, and we are to rest in him. We're to rest in him. Paul says it this way in Galatians 2, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Here's what he just said. He said, my faith in Jesus doesn't end after I've put faith in Jesus. My faith in Jesus persists even today. My day tomorrow, if you're curious... My day tomorrow is to get up with the boys, get them breakfast, pack their lunches, get them out the door. I'll beat Michelle in a game of backgammon. Uh, I'll go out the door uh, and I'll, drop, I'll go to Diego's Burritos, stop by Rose's for an unsweet tea, drop my car off at uh, Toyota for an oil change, have them shuttle me to my studio where I will stay and work until it's time for uh, staff meeting. Pierce, can you pick me up for staff meeting because my car is at Toyota? Pierce will pick me up uh, for staff meeting. We'll go to staff meeting. He'll drop me off at Toyota afterwards. I will then go back to the studio for an hour and a half. I will come back out here, do a workout with my friends, and then I will make dinner for the family and then have some nice evening time before I get into bed a little bit early and watch a show with Michelle. That's my day tomorrow, okay? Every moment of that has to be lived by faith in the Son of God. Every moment of that. None of that gets to be Ryan's effort. It's, if it's Ryan's effort, I get to the end of Monday and I'm wiped out. If it's the work of God in me, he gets to do his work in me. L- look at this in Galatians. Look at this in Galatians. I want to show you something. The law couldn't save us. The law couldn't make us holy, and yet somehow we still act like it does. Look at 
Look at 421. I'm going to start in chapter 4. Look at Galatians 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, or tell me, you who want to live according to the law, do you not listen to the law? It is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Now, I need to pause here and explain this to you really quickly. Abraham, famous character in the Old Testament, okay? And he had two sons, Paul says. He actually had eight. He had six more after these two boys, but they don't matter in the story, all right? Which is why Paul isn't bringing them up. But if you're wondering about that, if you're like, whoa, didn't Abraham have more than two sons? Or you're remembering the song as a kid, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. You're like, I thought he had many sons. Well, anyway, we can talk about that another time. Paul wants to talk about two sons of Abraham, two sons. One is Ishmael and one is Isaac. Here's the story. Let me just explain it to you really quickly. God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, you're going to have a child. And through that child, the whole world will be blessed. Abraham goes, awesome. Abraham waits for about eight years. No child. So his wife says, why don't you sleep with our servant, have a child with her? That is by the will of Abraham. That is Abraham's effort and Abraham's work, and they have a kid, and that kid is called Ishmael. God goes, this is not the child, I promised. Abraham goes, I got it, though. I took care of it. God's like, no, no, no. (laughs) I promised you a child. So a few years later, 13 uh, years later, His wife gets pregnant. His wife is now 90 years old. Abraham is 100 years old. The Bible says that she was past the age of childbearing. Duh. (laughs) Right? She's 90. Okay? She has a child. That child's name is Isaac. This is the child that God promised. You have two children. You have one that was born to a slave woman and one that was born to a free woman. That language is going to be very important here in just a second. The one that was born according to the slave woman was born according to Abraham's effort. The one that was born according to the free woman was born according to God's promise and God's power. Everybody good still? Okay? Abraham had two sons, one born to a slave woman, one born to a free woman. Verse 23, but the slave, the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, born according to human effort, human energy, while the son of the free woman was born according to the promise of God. Now, this can be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to present-day Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with all her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those who have a husband. Now, you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Here's what he's saying. Let me explain it to you. You have Ishmael, the son of Hagar, the slave woman. And it corresponds to Mount Sinai. That's the law. That's where Moses received the law. Those who want to live under the law and under the rules and under the guidelines and according to human effort are in slavery. And then there is the one from the free woman that corresponds to the heavenly Jerusalem, not an earthly Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven. And those people are free. And those are the ones that are done according to the work of God. So here's the scenario. You have one of two camps you can fall into. Try to do it on your own. These are speaking of people who have not put faith in Christ. They're putting faith in themselves. Try to do it on your own, and you're a slave, or trust God, and you're free. Those are your two options. And we in this room would say, man, I have put my faith in God. Maybe you haven't gotten there yet. You can talk to myself or Pierce after it, but the rest of us, we're going, man, yes, I put my faith in God. I am in God. Then why do we keep trying to live like we're children of the slave woman? Why do we keep submitting to the regulations and the rules? Why do we keep acting like we don't know Christ? Christ came to set us free. Look at this. Chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Freedom from slavery, freedom from the law, freedom from the rules. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. All, All the law in the world will not save you. All the law in the world will not make your kids holy. Give them Jesus. Jesus never quits being enough. In other words, you're going, man, I'm really worried that my kid won't go to heaven one day, so we give him Jesus. You're like, man, I'm really worried that my kid's going to run with the wrong crowd, and we give him rules. No, no, no. The rules haven't become enough. They never were. 
We're worried that our kids won't know Jesus. We're worried that our kids won't go to heaven. We're worried that our kids' sins won't be forgiven, so we give them Jesus. But we're also worried that they won't make wise choices. We're also worried that maybe they'll struggle in this area or that area. We don't give them rules. We give them Jesus again. He who began this work in us carries it on to completion. Jesus is all, like, I know it's cliche, but Jesus is always the answer, Right? It really is. In church, Jesus is the right answer. Man, Ryan, I want a better marriage. What do I need? You need Jesus. Like, man, I have Jesus. I'm a Christian. Great. You still need him. Ryan, I want to show my kids more love and more compassion. What do I need to do? You need to know how deeply Jesus loves you and the compassion he's poured out on you. Jesus will still be the answer tomorrow. He who started this work in us carries on to completion. Look at this. We're going to get into this a little bit more next week, so I won't unpack it all today. But jump down to 516. Paul says this, But I say if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Don't just make... Remember, you got to look at what he said about flesh in chapter 4. How, look at what Abraham did according to the flesh. Look at what God does. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For all the people who come to me and go, man, I'm only human. I'm always going to screw up. I show them this verse. What do, you do with this? what do you do with this text? What do you do with the Bible that says, if you live according to the Spirit, you won't act according to the flesh? Everybody's like, well, I'm only human. Well, the Holy Spirit is only the Holy Spirit, which happens to be bigger than you being only human. Like, he created. He, he was with the Creator in the beginning. Like, wh- why? Why? We read these stories in the Bible, and we go, man, that's amazing. I cannot believe this thing happened, or I can't believe that thing happened. I can't believe uh, that that Peter walked on water. Like, we're like, man, if I could just be like Peter. Do you know the story, right? John chapter 6, Jesus is up on a mountain. He's praying. His disciples have already gotten in a boat. They're going across the sea to the other side. They've been rowing for about six hours. They've made it three miles because of the stormy weather. The Bible says that Jesus from the top of the mountain sees them over there. So he comes walking to them on the water. Storm doesn't phase him. He's walking on water. He's going to pass them by. Another really funny thing in scripture. You know why? It took him a few minutes to get out there. It's taken them six hours to get to that point. He knows walking is faster than the boat. He's going to pass them by. He can get to the other side faster, you know? They're scared. They say, it's a ghost. He goes, it's not a ghost. It's me. Like, that's his answer. It's not, it's me. Peter goes, if it's really you, tell me to come to you on the water. <laughs> All right, Peter, come to me on the water. I wonder if, like, Peter, like, <laughs> you know, kind of that. <laughs> the other 11 guys going, All right, Peter, you know, like, go ahead. Right? Boat's going like this. Peter, like, <laughs> boom. Right? And he begins to walk to Jesus on the water. We don't know how far he walked. The Bible didn't tell us. I promise you this, though. It wasn't three miles, the distance Jesus had just covered. He sees the wind and the waves. He begins to get fearful. He begins to sink. Jesus reaches down and pulls him up and says, oh, you have little faith, (laughs) you know? And we look at stories like that, and we go, man, wouldn't it be amazing to be like Peter? No. We haven't been asked to be like Peter. We've been asked to be like Jesus, What churches preach is, well, I'm only human. I'm going to sink. No. Nowhere in the Bible are we called, look like Peter. Nowhere in the Bible are we told, act like Peter. Nowhere in the, like, Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, look, follow my example, but only as I follow the example of Christ. Ergo, follow the example of Christ. We go, yeah, but Ryan, I'm only human. You're right. You're only human. I'm only human. We've screwed a lot of things up. God is bigger than that. And we have been misguided when we have been taught that our Christian walk is our responsibility. You know what our responsibility is? Our responsibility is to be dead, to get out of the way. I have been crucified, back to Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. You know why you get offended? Because you're alive. You know why you lose your temper? Because you get... You're alive, your preferences, your, your, what you want, your expectations aren't being met. What if, what if we got out of the way? 
What if, we, what if we really, really just said, God, I, I need you to do this work in me? What if we really believed Romans 6, 11 that says, because we've died with Christ, because we've been raised to walk in newness of life, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. What if we really just believed that we were dead now and God was alive in us? What if we really believed that? Man, it'll change everything for you. You go, Ryan, you don't understand. I have battled with pornography for over a decade. I can't seem to shake it. You never will. If, if you're the source of your strength, if you're the source of your power, you never will. But the spirit of God that lives in you has no problem with it. He can overcome it in a moment. Get out of the way. You're like, Ryan, you don't understand the, mar- the tension my marriage has been under. It's not because of Jesus. It's because of you and me. What are the the problems? Get out of the way. Be the tree in the sun and just let the sun be the sun. Let God do the work. Don't you think he wants to? Don't you think he wants to change you into his image? The the work, the, the, the job of the Holy Spirit is to make you look more like Christ. Guess what the Holy Spirit will do? Make you look more like Christ. This was never about being a better version of ourselves. It never was. Christianity that preaches that, Christianity that says God wants you to be the best version of yourself, they do not understand Christianity. This is not being about a better version of you. This is about being like Christ. And you and I cannot, of our own power, be like Christ. That requires his work in us even still. Here's the great news. He's really good at his job. Let him do it. Brings us to our prayer. God, we ask you to do your work in us so that our lives will bring you glory and honor. Not God make me better, not God make me stronger, not God make me, God do this. Like God make me pray more, make me read more, make me, like none of that. God, do your work in us so that our lives will bring you glory. God, help us to get out of the way. Take a moment just to pray that right where you are, would you? God, you are bigger than us and more gracious than us. Holiness finds its source in you and love finds its source in you and grace and mercy finds its source in you. And God, I pray that you would forgive us for all the times that we've tried to do it on our own. To just think that if we tried harder, we could be like you. And I pray, God, that you would just work in us that where our ego or our preferences or our pride gets in the way that you would kill it and that Holy Spirit, you would faithfully, having started this work in us, bring it to completion. That you would make us more like Christ day by day by day. God, that we would cease striving and that we would just rest in you. God, that we would quit resting on our own laurels, that we would quit resting on our own accolades, and that now, God, we would rest in your work, accomplished by Jesus at the cross, empowered by the Holy Spirit at work in us, and that we would rest in you for your glory and for your honor and for your name and renown.